So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Mahmoud Salama. I'm assistant professor of OBGYN and the director of the Oncofertility Consortium at Michigan State University. Uh, thank you all for joining our uh, Oncofertility webinar uh, today. Uh, the webinar will take about uh, 45 minutes, followed by 15 minutes questions and answers. Please keep your mic muted and your camera turned off throughout the webinar to avoid the side noise and to ensure a smooth uh, webinar broadcast. If you have a question, please post it in the chat and we will open the discussion at the end of the webinar with the ability to turn on your mic and camera to ask questions. The webinar will be uh, recorded and uploaded afterwards to our own State Consortium YouTube uh, channel. Today, uh, we warmly welcome Professor Marcia Inhorn uh, to speak about her newest book, Motherhood on Ice, The Mating Gap and Why Women Free Their Eggs. That uh, this draws upon interviews with more than 150 American women to explore the, their use of egg freezing as a fertility preservation technology. Professor Einhorn is a professor of anthropology and international affairs at Yale University, where she serves as the chair of the Council on Middle East uh, Studies. A uh, specialist on Middle East gender, religion, and health, Professor Inhorn has conducted research on the special impact of infertility and assisted reproductive technology in Egypt, Lebanon, and the United Arab Emirates and Arab America over the past 35 years. She is the author of six books on the subject, editor and co-editor of 13 volumes, founding editor of Journal of Middle East Women's Studies, and co-editor of the Bergen Book series on fertility, reproduction, and sexuality. Professor Inhorn has received more than a dozen awards for uh, her books and scholarship, and along with her colleague, Sarah Franklin of Cambridge University, is the recipient of a major Wellcome Trust Foundation grant for a global project on changing in uh, fertilities. So thank you a lot, Marcia, for joining us today. And we are uh, looking very much forward to your talk. Well, thank you so much for that nice uh, introduction and especially yeah. in our connection to the Middle East. Uh, <laughs> I am mostly a scholar of the Middle East, but my presentation today is entirely on America. Um, and I'm really appreciative of the Onco Fertility Consortium for bringing me um, here on the webinar. And I should say that I did do some work with women freezing their eggs for medical reasons, but today I'm going to be talking about women who freeze their eggs for elective or social reasons. And I have to give a shout out to Dr. Lynn Westfall, who the study wouldn't have happened really without her help. And um, she gets my highest praise. So thank you, Mahmoud and Lynn, for being here today. Um, so let's see, moving forward. Uh, here we go. Uh, this is my new book. Um, it's coming out on May 1st from NYU Press uh, called Motherhood on Ice, The Mating Gap and Why Women Freeze Their Eggs. And just to kind of remind all of us, you know, egg freezing by way of vitrification is about a decade old. We should consider this the 10th anniversary celebration where, you know, ASRM lifted the experimental label on oocyte cryopreservation um, on October 19th, 2012. They published a major statement in early 2013. And the very first year that egg freezing was clinically available in the US, 5,000 cycles were estimated to have been performed. That more than doubled five years on in 2018. And the most recent SART data shows that it's doubled again, this time in three years. And um, as Lynn and others who are doing egg freezing for their patients know, there was a huge demand for egg freezing in the midst of the COVID pandemic when young people were on lockdown and women were concerned about their declining fertility. Um, and so egg freezing requests really you know, they're almost uh, jumped up 31%, according to SART. Since the moment of its inception a decade ago, egg freezing has been the subject of a lot of debate in the media, in scholarship, in feminist circles. And I just want to briefly sort of remind us what people are saying out there in the world about egg freezing. And so the media, there's been a huge media discourse on egg freezing and, you know, why women are doing it and whether it's worth it. And there's been a lot of critique. And really I've come up with, I sort of just describe in the book, the five most common portrayals of women who freeze their eggs 
are first that these are young women. These are women in their 20s who are, you know, future oriented, planning their careers. And the notion of career planning as the underlying reason for egg freezing is the most cited, uh, presumed to be the most cited reason why women freeze their eggs. They're career planners. But then there's discussion about the 30 something women who freeze their eggs in the, their 30s because they're still climbing the corporate ladder. These are women who are sort of seen as selfish career women, forgot to have children, putting off their childbearing. And then when big tech firms like Google, Apple, and so on started providing egg freezing fertility benefits, um, there has been a lot of media discussion of the fact that, oh, well, women are just docile employees. They're being paid by firms to put off their childbearing indefinitely as workers for these companies. And so the firms are paying them to freeze their eggs. And that makes them gullible, gullible victims you know, of a male-oriented work culture. And there's been a lot of critique of the so-called profit-oriented fertility, fertility industry, which is sort of duping women into freezing their eggs. There's one sort of positive portrayal of egg freezers in the media, um, that these are actually feminist women who are fighting for reproductive choice, reproductive control and freedom, much as women did back in the days of birth control in the 1960s, and that egg freezing may actually give women a lot of reproductive autonomy, including from men themselves. So the media has had a lot to say about egg freezing. So have feminist scholars, most of it quite critical. Um, and I, again, in the book, identified the sort of four main themes of feminist scholarship about egg freezing, only one of which is complementary or positive. And that is the first, which we could call neoliberal feminism. And these are just feminists who say, look, this is like, a, it's a new reproductive technology. It offers women some additional reproductive choice, more freedom to make decisions, more autonomy, more reproductive control, we should consider it as revolutionary as the pill. But then there are three strains of feminism that disagree with that. And the first, and I think the most common sort of critique comes from so-called structural or materialist feminists who argue that egg freezing is being used to to solve some underlying social problems that it really can't solve. And this is especially about women in workplaces, labor market participation, which makes it very difficult for women to balance home and work. And therefore women are sort of being forced into egg freezing, forced into the postponement of their reproduction so that they can be good workers. And this is really, egg freezing is just a sort of technological tool, but there are other underlying issues that need to be solved first. There's a strain of feminism, one that I do really agree with, called intersectional feminism, which looks at the fact that egg freezing is so costly in America and in many other places that it's really impossible to access for many women. And so this makes egg freezing exclusionary, very hierarchical, that only certain kinds of women can use uh, egg freezing to control their reproduction. And ultimately, it then becomes a rather unjust um, you know, technology for all of those people who are prevented from ever accessing it because of its cost. Um, and then there's a brand of feminism that's been around since the early days of IVF, which we could just call techno-skeptical or Luddite feminist, feminism. Feminists who just don't like technologies, they don't like the over-application of technology to women's bodies. They say that egg freezing promotes commercialization of women's reproductive health. It biomedicalizes things further, just another biomedical intervention into women's reproduction, and that it can cause bodily harm, which is something that critics have been saying about IVF for the past 40 years. We don't know the future harms of this technology. So most of the feminist portrayals of egg freezing are actually quite, quite negative. And then there's the clinical literature. There have been many uh, major clinical overviews of egg freezing. And I must say that the ASRM has participated in this. They published an article in 2018 saying that we should call uh, elective egg freezing planned oocyte cryopreservation, you know, to say that women are planning this, they're using it in a planful manner, it's much like family planning, and we should consider it something that women are planning, they're planning their reproductive lives. And as you'll see, I think at the end of this, I don't quite agree with that terminology because I think the ASRM doesn't really understand why the majority of women are using egg freezing, not in such a planned way. 
But in this literature, the three most common verbs that are used over and over and over are that women are using egg freezing to postpone, defer, or delay their childbearing. And then why? There are four major reasons that are put forward. And the first, again, the same as in the media, it's about women who want to get their educations and their career aspirations. So they're freezing early so that they can plan their careers. There's suggestion on a more medical level that, well, actually egg freezing is being used wisely by women to prevent their age-related fertility decline and maintain their reproductive autonomy so that they have control over the timing of their reproduction. And then every once in a while it's noted, well, maybe women are doing it because they also lack an appropriate partner. So we've got these three discourses, the media, feminist scholarship, and clinical scholarship offering different opinions about why, why women are freezing their eggs. But in my book, I say, we really need to reconceive egg freezing and the discourse around egg freezing. We need to really know what women themselves say about it. Why are they waiting to have children? And then why do they turn to egg freezing? You know, what is their perception of what's going on in their lives and why they're waiting to have kids? And this is where the anthropological study came in. I am an anthropologist. I'm a medical anthropologist. Um, the funder was the U.S. National Science Foundation, the Cultural Anthropology and Science and Society programs. And I recruited women volunteers um, from four IVF clinic sites um, on the East and West Coasts. Um, uh, women who volunteered must have undertaken at least one egg freezing cycle. And ultimately, I interviewed exactly 150 women who had take, undertaken egg freezing. I also interviewed women who were in the middle of it or were considering it, but 150 women had completed at least one egg freezing cycle and 36 of them were doing it for medical reasons. And I'm happy to talk about that if you have any questions. I really truly hope to write a next book on medical egg freezing um, and women with cancer and other reproductive troubles. But today and in my book, I'm really focusing on the 114 women who electively froze their eggs without a medical diagnosis. I did these in-depth anthropological, we call them ethnographic interviews. And that's really what Motherhood on Ice is about. It's about women who I spoke with who had undertaken elective egg freezing. And I want to, I, I want to talk about what I call the egg freezing demographic. Who are, what are the, what is the kind of woman who's going to turn to egg freezing? What do we learn about who, who they are? What kind of demography do they entail? And it was pretty interesting. Um, this is an, a racially and ethnically diverse group of American women. There was an editorial published in the New York Times in 2016, very provocatively saying that egg freezing is for white women only. It was very critical saying this is not a technology that women of color are going to use, but that really wasn't true in my study. Um, one th two thirds of women in the study did identify as white or Caucasian, but there were many Asian American and some black, Latina, mixed race and Middle Eastern heritage women in the study. And I wanna to point to Asian American women were overrepresented demographically in my study and in the few other qualitative studies that have been done in America, Asian American women are overrepresented in my study at 18% of the women when they, in America, Asian Americans only constitute 5% of the US population. So a lot of Asian American women are freezing their eggs. Black and Latina women are underrepresented in egg freezing in my study and in other studies that have been conducted. They're there freezing their eggs, but not at the demographic proportions that would be expected um, looking you know, in terms of the US uh, population. So there is an issue of underrepresentation and overrepresentation in egg freezing, which is very interesting. And this also happens to correlate as well with religion, which I'm going to say a word about here. Most of the women were urban. I mean, I these are professional women. And because of where I recruited women from, they were mostly from the East Coast Corridor, from Boston down to Washington, D.C. But I interviewed women in the Silicon Valley Bay Area and other parts of uh, California, and women volunteered from other major cities like Chicago, Seattle, Austin, Texas. So there were women really from across America in the study. I asked, I was interested about religion. Do you identify as religious? And most women had been re raised in some religious, um, you know, denomination, the majority actually being Catholic in my study, but most women did not identify as being religious. They said they were secular. Or um, the Pew Research Center has uh, identified this new category among young people in America 
SBNR, which means spiritual, but not religious. People who feel spiritual, but they don't practice and organize religion. So there was, this was mostly a secular population. I will note there were a lot of Jewish women, 12% of the women in my study were Jewish. Jews are only represent 2% of all Americans. So again, we see an over-representation of Jewish American women in the study. And at the end, if you wanna talk about that, I, I can give you what I think the, the reasons for both Asian American women and Jewish American women being overrepresented in egg freezing. These women were not in their early 20s, not freezing at, at graduation uh, from college. These were late 30-something women. Um, the average age in my study was 36.6 or almost 37, which some people call age 37 seven the fertility cliff, when fertility really starts to decline. So these are women on the cusp of the fertility cliff. And that's been shown in many other studies as well. Women are freezing between 36 and 38. In my study, that most women, 73%, or really almost three quarters of women, were between the ages of 35 and 39 when they froze their eggs. Some were 40 or above, not ideal, not ideal in terms of the timing of freezing. And 17% were in their early 30s. I had only one woman in my study who was less than 30. She was age 29. Um, her dad was an IVF physician. So maybe that doesn't count. But this was a 30 something and a late 30 something population. And these women were high earning. Um, I didn't ask everyone what their salaries were, but those who volunteered were making very good salaries. The average American salary in the US um, is about $85,000. Um, and these women were making well over $150,000, putting them in the top 10%. And some were making well over $300,000, putting them in the top 5% of US earners. So this was an affluent population of women. Egg freezing, as you know, is expensive. Depending on how much medication you need, it's going to cost anywhere from ten dollars to $20,000 per cycle. But 90% of the women in my study were able to pay on their own Parents often volunteered to help, but most women paid on their own. And almost half of the women undertook more than one egg freezing cycle, which me meant that they were spending well over $20,000 in most cases to freeze their eggs. They had the money to do it. Well, they were highly educated. Um, and this is a key point, education. We're going to talk about that. Um, only a fifth of the women had stopped at the bachelor's level. Almost half had a master's degree, you know, there were MDs, there were PhDs, there were JDs, and there were MD PhDs. And strikingly to me, maybe because I recruited a lot of women from the East Coast, almost one third of women in the study had some Ivy League credential. They had done their master's degree at Harvard or Yale or Princeton, or you know they'd gone to college at one of these places, or they had gone to college at other what we call elite American universities, places like Duke, places like Georgetown, Stanford, MIT, and so on. So these were very well-educated women who'd had really the benefits of sort of premier education in the United States. And not surprisingly then, they were highly successful professional women. And this is in rank order. The majority of volunteers were in healthcare, physicians, nurses, healthcare managers, people in public health and healthcare policy, followed by women in government. Um, because women were recruited in the Washington, D.C. area, there were diplomats, foreign service officers, high-ranking military officers, women working in all sorts of federal agencies. Because I recruited from the West Coast, there were women in tech, engineers, designers, programmers, people who had started their own tech firms. Um, and then other things, women in consultancies, a, a lot of communications journalists, filmmakers, media and marketing professionals, women who'd started their own businesses, small business owners, and then women who worked in major corporations, and then lawyers, artists of various kinds, therapists of various kinds, and women like me in academia. So these were very high achieving professional women in this study, but their lament, they were almost all heterosexual. There were only three women who identified as bisexual, no women in my study identified as gay as lesbian. So these were almost all heterosexual women, but they were single. They didn't want to be, but they were single. 82% um, of the women in the study were without partners. 
and sort of different categories of singleness. Someone just said, I'm single. I don't know why I have been single for a long time. I've only had one relationship. I'm single. I don't have any partner in sight, just single. A lot of women said, I'm single, single, single. That's my issue. They were divorced women, um, 17%. And I heard a lot about divorces, a lot about bad divorces, soap opera-ish divorces, acrimonious divorces. There was an unhappy divorce population in this study. Women who were broken up, broken engagements, or they'd been in long-term relationships that had broken up over time. And then there were some women who said, you know, I'm single because I'm deployed overseas all the time. I work for a humanitarian organization or I, I work in the foreign service. It's so hard to meet anybody because I'm constantly getting deployed, military women as well. And then these two small categories, um, there are women, as you know, who are basically ending up being single mothers through assisted reproductive technology, through the use of donor sperm. And what I found in my study is that there were women who had frozen their eggs, hoping that they were going to meet somebody, but then they said, look at my choice. I'm just going to use a sperm donor and you know have a kid on my own. And a lot of women who freeze their eggs think about this. It's kind of like the major backup plan. This notion that women are doing egg freezing for career planning purposes, especially when they're young, did not pan out at all in my study. And it really hasn't in most of the other qualitative studies. Um, there were, it was only 2% of women in my study. They were young women, one who um, at age 30 said, I want to spend the next 10 years. I want to start a tech firm of my own. I'm going to devote the next decade to my career. And one young woman who had just passed the foreign service exam, and she was very excited and she said, I wanted to do this my whole life, you know, I'm going to put off having kids, but career planning was not the discourse in my study. The major problem was partnership problems, women facing ongoing partnership problems, not only all those single women, but the women who had partners in the study, there were 18% of women who were partnered, but half of them, their partners were not ready to marry and have children. The discourse of unreadiness, men who are unready was a major theme of the study, or women were in new relationships or very uncertain, tenuous relationships that they didn't know if it was going to last. There were some sad cases where men had actually married women saying that they would have kids with them. And then after they married, refused, reneged on their promise and said, I just can't see myself doing it. And then um, this final category, multiple partners, I call this old wine and new bottles, um, but there's a growing trend of polyamory, uh, having multiple committed relationships. And there were some women who were with men who were polyamorous and they weren't sure if they were gonna have children with them. So women facing ongoing partnership problems. And so this is the men as partners problem. This is not my own term. This is a term that comes from international reproductive health where there's a lot of discussion about, you know, the trouble with men as reproductive partners in terms of family planning, in terms of the use, the use of condoms, in terms of HIV risk, in terms of childbirth and pregnancy help. Men are often castigated for not being good partners to women in international reproductive health circles, like men in the global south are often critiqued, sometimes unfairly, I have to say. But I want to argue that what men in the global health, um, global north also might be problematic as partners. Because in my study, I would say that all the women who froze their eggs desired what I called the three Ps, partnership, pregnancy, and parenthood. That's what they wanted, to find a partner, to become pregnant, and to become a mom. But they were facing these three partnership problems. These men who were reluctant to be with them. So a lot of these women were single because they couldn't find a partner to be with. If they were with a partner, the partner was unready for marriage and children, so the unreadiness issue. And then uh, there was a lot of uh, sort of bad behavior among men and, you know, women telling me terrible things that had happened with previous relationships or being in a relationship with a man who was an alcoholic and they just couldn't, you know, be in the relationship anymore. So there were a lot of partner stories in my study. I heard a lot about men through women's eyes. And I will say I did not interview any men. So I hope this isn't being terribly unfair to the men of America. But this is what I heard from women about why they were freezing their eggs. My main finding is egg freezing is not being done mostly by career women to postpone their fertility intentionally. 
Rather, career women are attempting to preserve and extend their fertility at the end of their reproductive lifespans because they cannot find stable, committed reproductive partners, even though they want them. And then this begs the question, why are so many highly educated American professional women partnerless? You know, I had to start asking women, like, what do you think is going on? And this ended up in what I call, oh, here, okay, here's a typical lament. This woman was an academic physician, a very high powered academic physician who said to me, if I found a man, I'd move to Alaska, but most men don't want relationships. They just want to meet and date. And most women won't go out with the uneducated check stand dude, but men would date an uneducated woman. So I think I have about a 0.09% chance of meeting someone. And meanwhile, I was feeling like, OMG, my biological clock, it's ticking, it's ticking, it's ticking, it's ticking, you know? So even though I'm 1000% happy I did it, the egg freezing, it did somewhat, it felt somewhat like a defeat. I felt like I gave up because I couldn't find a man, which to me was very sad to hear this very accomplished woman saying this. And it, it wasn't just her, it was most of the women in my study. They had these gender laments and they were sort of circled around these three major themes, a lot of sort of very sad self-blame and self-doubt or shame even, fertility shame, you know, I must have done something wrong. And I'll say a few more words about that. Uh, women talked about their higher expectations for a partner today, but they felt that men had lower commitments to partnership. And so this first theme of self-blame and self-doubt really, you know, revolved around the question, like, how did I end up this way? Like, I never imagined myself at the age of 38, partnerless, you know, I, I never imagined that would be me, I can't figure out what happened. So am I too picky? Are my standards too high? And then women, once they get into their 30s, talk about like, am I too old now to keep a man's interest? There is a lot of ageism among men that women reported to me, you know, that especially women in their late 30s, they felt that men just ran away from them, expecting that these women were going to want to get babies right away. You know, am I not attractive enough? Women often said very uh, disparaging things about their own looks, which I would be looking at the woman saying, that's not true. You're very attractive. But women were often putting themselves down. Or am I not attracted to the right kind of man? You know, do I only go for the alpha males who don't want a woman like me? Did I not put enough energy into finding a man? And this all revolved around, mostly revolved around online dating, which is the way that people try to find a mate now in America. And many women said it's torture. It's horrific. It's like a second job. It's just so much time and energy and it, it leads to very little. And they felt exhausted often by online dating, which they noted creates a limitless, limitless marketplace of options, especially for men. They felt that online dating was much better for men in big cities than it was for women. And then women talked about their expectations for what they wanted out of a partnership because they had grown up in a generation with moms who had been influenced by feminist ideas that women should be equal to men, women should want to have a good career and a good relationship, and that women should want gender equality, not only at work, but at home with a man who they considered to be their equal. And so women said, you know, we're becoming more selective about who we, who we choose as mates. I don't want to settle for somebody. I don't want to enter into a desperation marriage just because I want to have a child. I'm looking for my soulmate. And this is a term that I learned in the study. I want a unicorn, that rare and special high-flying man who is my person meant to be, my unicorn, my magical special man. And women did talk to, about the fact that they couldn't imagine themselves doing something that we in anthropology call hypogamy, marrying down, down below their educational and class level. Like they couldn't imagine being married to a plumber who was not educated, for example. And so there's this issue of high achieving women only wanting high or even higher achieving men, but they're gonna narrow their options because there aren't a lot of men at the same level or higher than they are. And so if you're trying to marry up hypergamy, you're going to have a very narrow range of possibilities. So women talked about their own higher expectations, but they felt that men these days have lower commitments to marriage and reproduction. They said, well, we may have been raised to want gender equality, but that's not necessarily true of men in America. They may not want an egalitarian partnership they may want to continue to marry down to a woman who doesn't threaten them, who's less educated, less professionally accomplished. 
And then there, I heard a lot about this men today who just want to delay marriage and commitment because they are Peter Pans, a term I learned from California women, Peter Pans, the men who never grow up. They may be affluent, they may wine and dine you, they may have a lot of fun with you, but they want to have fun and they are not going to commit. They will just keep, you know, having fun and never grow up and never and never really commit to you if you happen to attach yourself to one. Intimidation was a word much discussed in the study. Women felt that men are often intimidated of them if they have more education, if they have a better job, if they make more money, that, you know, strong women, powerful women often are intimidating to men. And then, um, you know, we talked about divorce, the fact that many uh, younger generation people had parents who divorced and that divorce has probably caused a lot of trauma and distrust, including among men who may feel that it's an outdated institution. They saw their bad, their parents' bad marriages and they don't want to replicate that. And then ultimately that men today just may want to pursue other life goals besides marriage and fatherhood. That men today are not like their father's generation where men in the older generations expected that they should marry and have kids but that today people can be just single at heart. They may want to stay single because that is a life choice and option. But I want to argue that underlying these gender laments are also major demographic disparities that really no, very few people are talking about. But I think it's very important for this discussion of egg freezing that there are major gender-based educational disparities in the United States. We don't talk about them a lot but that women in America are dramatically rising in their educational achievement. This is something that we really should be celebrating while men are losing educational and labor market ground. And this is a real cause for concern, something that a lot of male scholars and media persons today are commenting about how American men are dramatically losing ground in education and in labor force participation, especially during COVID. There have been articles in the Wall Street Journal. There are books. There's one called Adrift. There's one called Of Boys and Men, all being very alarmed about what's happening to men who are, you know, falling off the educational trajectory. But what about women who are doing really well? Should we be worried about them too? And that's what I think we need to be talking about. Women in America are dramatically outperforming men now in American education. Look at this college board quote. Girls now account for 60% of high school students with A or A plus averages. They're taking harder classes than boys too. Girls account for 55% of all students taking AP or honors level math classes in math and science, which are traditionally male centered you know, disciplines. And then an MIT report called Wayward Sons argues, although a significant minority of males continues to reach the highest echelons of achievement in education and labor markets, med the median male in America is moving in the opposite direction. And this was really clearly laid out in a really great book called Datanomics, How Dating Became a Lopsided Numbers Game by an economic journalist named John Berger, who looked at US census data, and this is what he concluded. We have real gender-based educational disparities in America. Since about the 1980s and 1990s, American women have been graduating from university at far greater numbers than men. So that by 2015, there are four women who have graduated university in America for every three men who have. That is a four to three ratio. In 2020, the first year of the pandemic, there were 27% more American women than men in higher education. And in 2021, there was a huge slide out of college because of COVID and 71% of the decline in college admissions was attributable, attributable to men. By next year, female graduates are expected to outnumber male graduates by 38% in this country. And in the near distant future, it is estimated that we will have two University educated women for every one man who's gone to college in the US, that is a two to one ratio. So women are, there are many millions more educated men, in, women in America now than men. And Berger calls this the college educated man deficit and an oversupply of educated women. And he says it is a demographic time bomb for marriage minded heterosexual women these lopsided gender ratios incentivize the minority of educated men to really play the field. They have a lot of choices. And because they do, they delay marriage and reproduction. 
And it really leaves the most highly educated women at the top of the educational hierarchy in trouble, women like the women in my egg freezing study. We know that lesser educated men, working class men at the bottom are in trouble. There's been a lot of attention to that, but we also need to worry about sort of the fate of really educated women and their life experiences and choices and what they're hoping to do with their lives and how they might be very disappointed because of these educational disparities. And this is not just an American problem. This is a global problem. In 60% of the world's nations, according to the World Bank Gender Disparity in Gender Parity Index, um, we now see women in higher education at numbers far ahead of, of men. Um, Austria, which Mahmoud knows very well, is 18% more women in higher education. Belgium, 26%, drop down to Italy, 26%, Poland, 34%. The United Kingdom, you know, the UK, the exact same percentage as the US, 27% more British women in higher education than British men. Um, Scandinavia, which we consider to be the most gender egalitarian part of the world, it's, a, it's even in a worse problem, I would say. You've got pretty high percentages in Denmark. Look at Iceland, 48% more women in higher education than men. Sweden, 37%. And the Asia Pacific, um, same thing. If you look at Australia, it's almost exactly the same as the US and the UK. New Zealand, 35% more women in higher education than men in New Zealand. But of the East Asian societies, these numbers are there, including the huge country of China, which has got like 1.7 billion people. There are 16% more Chinese women in higher education than there are men now. And that's causing a huge problem, which in China is being called the leftover woman problem. It's, there's literally a name for it in this book called Leftover in China, that there are now millions of highly educated Chinese women who, because they're so educated, they're not going to find highly educated Chinese men. And those, the men that they will find are going to be very intimidated, intimidated of them and not want to marry them. And so women in China who have a PhD are be being called the third gender, as if they are an entirely different gender of people because they have PhDs and men will not want to go near them in, in the marriage market. In the US, um, there's a very poignant book by a Jewish American author named Melanie Notkin, who says, I and other I educated women like me in America, we were hoping for motherhood, but we ended up in otherhood. Unintentionally, we, we didn't find a partner. And so we end up being an other, not a mother. And she sort of says, the best we can do is to be a savvy auntie, to be a good aunt to our nieces and nephews. But, you know, there is this category of women in America who really hoped that they would be able to reproduce, but they never found their partner. And so I want to just point out that um, egg freezing, I'm going to say it is, you know, something that women in that situation should be allowed to use, but it is banned in some of the world's nations, including Austria, where Mahmoud has practiced uh, OBGYN, China, the big country where there are a lot of leftover women, bans egg freezing. And now some Chinese women are beginning to issue lawsuit suits against hospitals that are uh, basically preventing them as single women from accessing egg freezing. And that's a story to watch. Singapore did ban egg freezing for single women. It is now allowed, recently revised, but single women cannot, cannot be mothers on their own. They cannot use sperm donors to have children. They must use their frozen eggs within marriage. Having said that, there are well over 80 countries in the world now, according to the International Federation of Fertility Societies, that do allow egg freezing for women, you know, just a variety of the countries where it is allowed and is being practiced increasingly. So egg freezing is going global. It is not just a, a global North practice. But I... I say that it is about a global phenomenon that in my book I call reproductive weighthood, okay? You've got educated women in many countries who wanna become mothers of their own biogenetically related offspring. These are women facing fertility decline. They're reaching their mid to late thirties. They haven't found a partner. They haven't found an educated, committed reproductive partner, but they still wanna achieve their motherhood dream. And so they're turning to egg freezing in a state of reproductive weighthood. They're waiting for a mate, 
hoping one will materialize. Um, but you know, they're they're sort of in reproductive suspension, hoping to find a partner with whom to have children. And so back to the the mating gap, you know, which is in the title of my book. What is it again? Women want the three E's, but they lack these three E's. An eligible, educated, equal partner committed to marriage and family life. Without this, they're stuck in this reproductive weighthood. They're waiting for a mate. And the mating gap and this state of reproductive weighthood are well beyond women's individual control. You know, it's not their fault. It's a demographic issue. They are not alone. There are millions of other women like them. And so egg freezing has sort of entered into this scenario as a kind of very costly technological concession for women to bridge the mating gap while they're kind of stuck in this state of reproductive suspension, which I'm calling reproductive weighthood. In that state of affairs, does egg freezing provide benefits for women? You know, the women who choose to use it, what does it provide? I found that 93% of women in my study uh, said that they were glad they had something positive to say about their decision to freeze their eggs. And there were these sort of 10 categories of things that it made them feel good about, that they had been given choices, they had more options, it allowed them to take control and to make some decisions about their reproductive futures. Empowerment was the word that women used over and over. I felt wildly, wildly and weirdly empowered by doing it. It gave me a sense of power. The term insurance policy and safety net was used frequently, um, although there's been a lot of critique of the issue. Is egg freezing really an, an insurance policy? Probably not. But women felt that it would prevent future regret that they tried to do everything they could in their power to you know, maintain their reproduction. It provided tremendous psychological relief to women. They felt like a great weight and a burden was off their shoulders, that they could look for a relationship without feeling desperation, that every person had to be the future baby daddy of their child. Um, and women talked about a sense of self-investment. It was something I could do for myself at this particular juncture in my life. It gave me a sense of success and this feeling of technological optimism. I'm so glad I live in an era where this technology is available. It helps me to do something about my timing, the fact that I'm in my late 30s and I can still hold on and extend my fertility. But on many levels, we have to really ask, is egg freezing a real solution? It is actually for many women accompanied by a lot of sadness and feelings of stigma, regret, sometimes shame and loneliness especially for women going into IVF clinics, which are very couples oriented married places. Women often said, you know, I felt so lonely and so stigmatized. I'm the only woman there without a ring on my finger. And so I have a whole chapter sort of arguing that we need better patient centered care for women who are freezing their eggs in IVF clinics. Egg freezing is kind of like a stop gap, a bit of a band-aid measure to stop the clock while still looking for a partner, as we see usually at the end of a woman's reproductive lifespan. And it can't solve, you know, the deep societal problems, which I've just outlined. It's a technological solution. It's costly, but it doesn't get at the underlying issues of, you know, educational disparities and partnership problems with men. But women do feel that it's a way to prevent a desperation marriage. Um, when you're stuck in this situation of reproductive weighthood, it does give you more time to try to figure out what your next choices are, hoping to find a man or making a decision about whether you're going to be a single mom on your own, which was sort of something that a lot of women were thinking about. At the end of the book, I do offer my few recommendations. I, I do argue that, you know, egg freezing is not the appropriate technology for most young fertile women in their 20s. I don't believe egg freezing should be given as a college graduation gift to women as they leave college. Most young women have good fertility. Many of them will find a partner. And, you know, it's just not, it's a, it is a costly intervention. It is something, you know, that involves the body. So probably not something that most women in their 20s should be doing. But if women do enter their 30s and they're single and they want to be a mother and they haven't found a partner, it is something that I believe women should consider, but the cost must either be brought down or insurance must be offered to increase access. Um, this was something women felt very strongly about. It was their major recommendation. This 
technology would be useful for a lot of other women who can't access it. They can't afford it. They don't have insurance for it. And they, women in my study felt that there was a lot of discrimination against single women, including straight single women and lesbians employed in companies that did offer fertility benefits to married couples, to married women. They said, you know, married women are trying to like overcome their infertility through IVF. I work for the same company. I'm single. I'm trying to prevent myself from having to go through future IVF for infertility. I feel discriminated against simply because I'm single that I can't access my company's fertility benefits. You know, egg freezing, as I said, is not a solution to the mating gap. As one woman in my study said, we need to fix men. Um, until men can be fixed, basically educational underachievement can be addressed in this country. You know, egg freezing is, in some sense, it's the single best reproductive option for now among women in their 30s who still are hoping to find a partner, you know, still want to be a biological mother. Um, and it is a way to hold on to one's potential fertility. And so I totally understand why women are using it. I would never condemn women for using egg freezing. And I do think it is an important reproductive option that has been made possible in the last decade. Um, and, but there are lots of ongoing questions like, you know, what is the ideal number of frozen eggs? Women really were stressed about this. Do they get enough eggs? Do they freeze enough eggs? Are women going to return in mass in numbers to use their frozen eggs? Because so far they have not. Will we see a lot of frozen egg babies in the future? Don't know. Is egg freezing going to sort of normalize over time so that women, every, every woman sort of thinks about it or considers it? And is it going to globalize further? You know, it's available in, in about half of the world's nations. Will it continue to globalize around the world? Will younger women start freezing their eggs more regularly? And then the big questions, you know, is it going to be as revolutionary as the pill at some point? That has been argued by some commentators. Is egg freezing the future of reproduction in America and, and beyond? And in my thinking about those questions, those big questions right now, my predictions are that is egg freezing a reproductive revolution? That was the title of my NSF grant proposal, egg freezing as a reproductive revolution. I don't think at the present time that it really is. Not enough women are doing it. Um, it's not a mainstream reproductive technology uh, in the US or around the world. But in the future, as the discussions around egg freezing grow, and perhaps if the cost is brought down, maybe it will be a reproductive revol revolution. Really only time will tell. And I thank you for listening to me and happy to answer questions. Thanks a lot, Marcia, for this great uh, talk. Um, can you stop sharing your uh, slides so then we can see everybody and yeah. start to receive okay. questions? And let's see, multiple part can share simultaneously. I don't want to do this. Yes. I have the new form of, let's see, one participant can share at a time. Uh, stop share. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Perfect. So thanks again, uh, Marcia, for this uh, interesting talk. Um, now we can open the discussion for questions. So please feel free to raise your hand, uh, turn on your mic and camera to ask questions uh, directly. So uh, I do actually uh, see one see question. One question, yeah. Okay, one question. What is the maximum age do you, uh, what the maximum age you do egg freezing for your uh, patients? Yes, I am not a medical doctor. I'm a PhD researcher. I'm a medical anthropologist, mm -hmm. but I do talk about um, age and sort of the ideal age to freeze in the book. Um, I did interview a wide variety of physicians around the country who offer egg freezing. And um, it's, let's just say that fertility decline begins happening around age 32 in a sort of significant way, but it really declines significantly around age 37. So the physicians that I interviewed said, you know, the sweet spot is probably there somewhere between 32 and maximally 37. Most physicians would say, you really shouldn't be freezing in your 40s. It's really too late. Your chances of being successful are very low in your 40s. Um, and so my argument is like, I don't think women in their 20s, unless their med medical egg freezing is an entirely different story, but probably the ideal is the early 30s, you know, ideally early 30s, and probably um, 
you know, if you're in your late thirties or early forties and you still have really good fertility, um, I think that a lot of IVF clinics or a lot of places that do offer egg freezing will do that for women. Um, but it's not going to be the maximal age for most women. It really is by, by your late thirties, late, late thirties or early forties. Um, it's not ideal, <laughs> better eggs when you're younger. Let's just put it that way. Okay. Is there any other question? Hi. Hi. I don't have a question. I'm an REI from Montreal. I just want to say thank you for an amazing talk. Hey, um, I do a lot of egg freezing and uh, I just thought it was really interesting to see the anthropological data on the educational uh, gap and the relationship issues and really in Canada, this is too, Karen, in, Canada, in Canada, the educational gap is almost identical to America. It's a huge issue for Canada. I believe too. you. And this is what I'm hearing from my patients. And so I'm happy to see it in the statistics because it validates everything that I see. So thank you so, so much for that. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, men need to, it's, we, we're, in, we're in some trouble here <laughs> in terms of partnerships. I'm happy to talk about medical egg freezing too, because I have written three articles on medical egg freeze and I am happy to, you um, know, I hope to write a book about it on sabbatical next year, but um, a different story. That is a different story than this story, as you know. Let's see, any other questions in the chat or? Uh, I have just um, a comment, Marcia, on, um, you know, now um, the social egg freezing is very um, common in many countries, including now Austria also, they are allowing social egg freezing. Uh, and I think recently also um, egg donation. And many patients actually um, try to find um, uh, suitable fertility solutions for their situation, you know, even if, when they don't find um, a chance in their country, they move and travel to another country to have uh, such treatments. Um, of course, uh, you uh, studied this phenomenon, the cross-border reproductive care in many countries, and I want to, uh, from you to give us uh, some um, impression about what is going on now in the world regarding this. Yeah, oh, thank you so much, Mahmoud, for that. Yeah. Mahmoud has done a lot of great work on cross-border reproductive travel, and so have I, and we've done some work together on that. And I found it in my study, too. It is actually an important phenomenon. Um, if you're in a country that doesn't offer egg freezing to you, um, that's one of the reasons why women are traveling. Um, but I found in America, in the United States at least, um, women who just couldn't afford the cost in the U.S., for the hormonal medications, the, you know, America is the, the most expensive country in the world in which to freeze eggs or to do IVF in general. We know that from lots of work on the economics of IVF. It's very expensive in the U.S. to do all this. So there were women who traveled to other countries to do the egg freezing or to buy hormonal medications and bring them back. And I have some very funny stories. Actually, I have a great story from Egypt of a woman mm -hmm. who got her hormonal medications in Egypt, flew back to America. And, um, you know, I, yeah, women are going to Spain to freeze their eggs. You know, Spain is kind of this global hub for egg donation, as we know. And so women are going to do it there simply because it's less expensive. And so, you know, issues of cost and access are the big barrier, I'm going to say, in the United States for more women doing it. And, you know, it was sad to me, um, uh, and, you know, these women were remarkable, you know, great pe women to talk to. And, you know, some of them had sisters or cousins or friends who were not in the same economic category, you know, friends who were teachers or friends who did work that wasn't getting them these huge salaries. And they're like, you know, I, my friend really would like to use it, but, or my sister would like to freeze her eggs. She's in the same situation as I, but there's no way she's a teacher. There's no way she's ever going to be able to afford it. And um, there was sisterly egg sharing, you know, women saying like, if I'm going, if I can't use these eggs, I'm going to give it to my sister. She'll never be able to do this. She doesn't make enough money. So that issue is why women are traveling or trying to come up with these sort of creative solutions um, to, you know, egg sharing, because it's very expensive. And so thank you for bringing that up. 
Um, that's what people do um, when they when it's not available in their own country or when it's too costly or there are legal problems or religious issues that are, you know, bans, they, they, they go abroad. Yeah, so it's happening for egg freezing too. And I have a very dear colleague who, um, she froze her eggs in Spain. She didn't find her man. She got together with her best friend from college. They went to Spain together, did the fertilization, and she now has, they, they now have a beautiful frozen egg baby. <laughs> so it, it worked for her, thank goodness. Thanks a lot, Marcia. So if there are any question. So in case uh, there is no question, so I would like to thank you, Marcia, so much and thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, the webinar has been recorded and uh, will be uploaded afterwards to our uh, consortium YouTube channel. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for uh, being here with us today and uh, looking forward to seeing you soon in our uh, next webinars. Have Thank a great you, day. Dr. Salama. Thank you so much. Thank I really you. enjoyed my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Bye-bye.